if you come from the front lines of hunger or global work, this was a very significant day. Um, and this is the day that the vegetable salesman in Tunisia walked in front of the governor's office. And what had happened is this is a man who had to support eight children with his um, income from his little vegetable stand. And yet again, the government tried to seize his stand because he was selling in an illegal place, but there were no legal places to sell. And he was so frustrated because he simply wasn't able to try to provide for his own family, lit himself on fire at that moment, Mohammed Bua Zizi, and the world changed. And I only say this because this is a different era. We've never lived in an era where something that happens in one place <coughs> can move so quickly and change the dynamics of an entire region. And what followed that really would, would, would have been unimaginable in policy just 10 or 20 years ago. But I'm going to reach back and just quote a former Secretary General of the UN who uh, won a Nobel Peace Prize, and really an amazing man, Doug Hummershaw, who said, it's when we all play safe that we create a world of utmost uncertainty. It's when we all play safe that fatality will lead us to our doom. It is in the dark shade of courage alone that the spell can be broken. And I just point this out because what, if you look at what happened since that moment in Tunisia, we really don't see the stepped up kind of action on all of these fronts that's causing so much pressure in the world. And so, you know, it becomes a very important question what's paralyzing governments and leadership to really start looking at solving some of these problems. I have a bucket list that I think are things that are doable by the world. And it's kind of like, these things can happen. They actually don't need new discoveries. They're actually not impossible. We'll talk a little bit about some of those. I believe we face the decision as governments, as public leaders. We have a choice. We have become less relevant. And you see resistance to supporting governments around the world with taxes because of the ineffectiveness, less credibility, less attractive <coughs> talent. Where is the best talent in the world going? Is it going to governments? <coughs> <coughs> or become less relevant or transform. And I will just say that I find in government you still have agencies not on just industrial era timing, but on agrarian era timing. Literally releasing reports once a year that now people need very regularly. And I'll just give you a sense of this. At the World Food Program, when I came, they used to price the commodities that we would buy in the billions of dollars every year to help feed hungry people in the world. We deliver about 35 billion meals a year to people. And we would price those out once every two years. And when I came, the food prices started amping up, and we'd have to price it out every uh, month. And by the time I left, we'd have to price it three times a day to keep up with it. Our government systems keeping up with the rapid and accelerated change in information. So just uh, to quickly go through the framing of one of these challenges, food, which is the first Millennium Development Goal to cut the proportion of hunger in the world in half. What intrigues me about this problem is we totally know how to feed the world. And as we see here, there's more than enough food today. In fact, there's 4,600 kilocalories per person. And yet, even after loss and feeding animals and all of that, there's 2,700 kilocalories a day. A person needs about 2,100 to be viewed as having an adequate kilocalorie diet. And yet, we know that still today, every 10 seconds, we lose a child to hunger. And so we see that these numbers aren't budging. And one would ask, why should we care? Is this really an issue for secretaries of state, for secretaries of defense, for presidents, prime ministers? Well, it's interesting. When the food prices hit and 140 million more people were thrown into abject hunger around the world, I'm not going to go through these, but let's just say change the structures of global food systems. 
in very significant way. Um, I have to leap forward to the slide I want to do here, but and the demand is growing. So over the next 40 years, we have to produce more food than the last 8,000 years combined by pretty much all estimates of demand in the world. Um, but what we saw in 2008 is something I said at the time, which I saw with my own eyes happening all around the world. <coughs> People are starving, and they can't get access to food. They really have only three options, to revolt, to migrate, or to die. And at the time, you know, if you're looking for a plan B in the world, there really wasn't a plan B. And yet the disruption of that happening, and for much of the world there still isn't. This is um, a chart uh, put together by the Crisis uh, <coughs> Institute here in Cambridge. All this does is map the prices of food and the number of riots in the world. And there's really a very direct cor correlation. And so the argument that I make are these issues, such as water and food, really become very central to governance. And the problem is, how do you tackle them? So the first thing I would just say that I saw happening in 2008 is countries or leaders turning the pressure to change into an opportunity, sort of contrasted as to what was happening in Tunisia and Egypt and other places. I just want to mention Brazil which is now defeating hunger faster than any nation on earth, put together an extremely interesting and creative approach, taking best practices from around the world. And WFP it was so interesting that I personally spent time deep in the field studying this. And what they do, just a short part of this collaboration, is they decided they were going to take bold action and make sure every child in school had food. So you alleviate that deep pressure in society where people really panic mostly about their children. And then they were going to source a third of the food from the smallest farmers, who would be the ones who would suffer the most in a financial downturn and difficult times. And rather than give subsidies to the farmers, they gave them a guaranteed market. It's an extremely innovative approach to subsidies. Not only that, when the kid gets the food in school, they get vaccinations and a small cash payment for the parents if the children get good grades in school. And this is causing a very dynamic change in the way um, parents look at educating their children and their own opportunities. And what this was was an entire safety net during the 2008 food crisis and financial crisis for Brazil. Um, and just to mention, WP at the time was under severe pressure, and we began buying food from the very farmers who were dependent on food aid. And Chris, you were in southern Sudan, you would have seen that. So farmers who can't sell their food if they're in war zones because they have no trucks, no more come in, it's too dangerous, <coughs> WP was bringing them food, and we had the radical idea of saying, what if we bought their food and paid them and took that food out today about 1% of WFP's food is bought from these farmers who would have been neglected. But that pressure for change can really turn into an opportunity to do things differently. Two, don't wait be to become the boss to be a leader. And I think Nick can testify to the frustrating string of meetings where a lot of people report <coughs> problems, but very few people come up with or model solutions. I think there's less resistance than people would think to um, people doing things different. And just to give an example from my world, WFP's been delivering food to the people of Northern Cameroon for decades. And I'm going to later talk about asking the right questions. But if you look at the problem, the reason why people are starving is because once they harvest their food, there are no warehouses to put the food in. So our local leader there thought, maybe we should do things differently, and negotiated with governments around the world that rather than buy food aid, to offer villages a warehouse. And the 
food aid would go in the warehouse, so it would cost more one year, and the European Union boldly supported this, and then um, the food aid would go into the warehouse, people could draw it down, and they'd have to pay back next harvest, but the village would finally have a warehouse. And I, I would just trust me in saying, you would be shocked at the dearth of warehouses around the world. A huge percentage of global hunger is called, caused by the fact there's no place to s store food. Now there was a problem because the villagers say that's great, but we don't trust each other and we're not going to put our food in the warehouse. And our leader here sat down with women's councils and asked them how to solve this before giving up. And the women said, oh, this is easy. Put three keyholes in the door and get the keys to three other people in the village, and then we'll develop a trust system. And this three keyhole door <laughs> unlocked the problem. Now, what that leader did in Northern Cameroon, who was Cameroonian and I would never have known, is revolutionize the way WP does business around the world. And so this is why I say, don't wait to be boss. A lot of people think they'll wait 20 years saying, once I get in charge, once I get in charge, once Buy yourself some space wherever you are to say, can I try doing things a little bit different? Convince people to support you and then make it a success. Three, be a problem solver, not a problem observer. And I'm just going to ask you all to do a test in life. Sit at policy tables wherever you go and just plot the minutes spent on stating what the problem is versus anyone offering one idea on how the problem can be different. Watch TV, watch C-SPAN, watch UN debates, and just observe. It is extremely easy to feel you're doing something good in the world by saying this is terrible, this is terrible, this is terrible, there's abuses, there's abuses, there's this. Just watch and clock the percentage of time. And your tolerance for all of the pro stating of the problem versus solving of the problem will grow smaller and smaller as you realize that this is where we spend most of our time in the world on problem observation uh, rather than solving. And I will just point here when WFP could not get food into Gaza or into the West Bank, I brought together some of the kind of most dynamic people there and said, what do we do? They said, deliver food on the cell phone. I said, deliver food on a sick. You know, I'm going to talk about the need to embarrass yourself by saying, I don't understand really how to do that. And so whether it's a cell phone or by satellite or by the swipe card, WFP used to have to go through 16 checkpoints to be able to get food in here. And when tensions got very high, we couldn't get it in. So you will often hear policy people sit around the table and say, yes, people are starving and we can't get food in. And it's very, you have legitimate excuses, right? Push it to the next level and say, so what do we do? And in this case, we don't deliver any food into the West Bank anymore. This happens to be in Hebron. People get this little card, and they can go to shops and get nine food items. They have to be healthy, and they all have to be locally produced. And this increased the dairy industry in Hebron area by about 30% in one year. So it was a win-win-win type of thing. No food has to go through checkpoints. Four, look and lead beyond the barriers. It is um, extremely easy to see the walls and extremely difficult to see how to remove them and change them. And I'll just give an example. When the Lancet series came out in 2007, it had a shocking piece of information. It's a magazine. It's a scientific report. It says that children who do not have adequate nutrition from conception to two years old, their brains will never develop. It can't be fixed. And this is a malnourished child, a normal child at three years old. The brain can actually be 40% smaller. So it was always believed that when a child got out of trouble, eventually in life, hopefully, their brain could grow, their body could grow, but it was permanent, so the, it was the scientific conclusion, it couldn't be fixed. And to me, I called that at the time the burden of knowledge, because it rocked the world on its axis. To me, the world had to reprioritize 
to reach those children, to give them a shot, because all the other aid, all the other help, all the health insurance, everything we did would be wasted on a child that's already so far be behind due to this. And the synapses in the brain also are dramatically reduced. So there's many studies now on the effects and costs to the economies of countries that have this. And India is estimated to cost $24 billion a year lost to their economy due to the burden of that malnourishment. It costs about $10 billion to fix it, about $260 billion lost from the poorest economies of the world. And no nation can be arrogant about this. The US had severe malnutrition problem. Up and through World War II, Europe the same thing. So um, for WFP, it wasn't only changing mindsets, and the policies of the UN now have fully changed on this. But WFP used to deliver a cup of food, and the only requirement we had was kilocalories. And today there are nutrition standards for the food. <coughs> so this cup has to have adequate nutrition. That's a revolution. It costs a little bit more. There's a lot of resistance. You have to convince the world that you have to connect these two dots. But this food in particular is uh, really revolutionizing the front lines. It's a, um, it's a chickpea mush, and it has uh, adequate nutrition to protect a child's brain and body, and uh, it's climate-proof food. So you can just squeeze it in a child's mouth. And so these types of barriers can be removed, and I would just say that it requires people seeing that. This is a child in, in Somalia who was uh, in stage four malnutrition and after using that five weeks later. So these types of breakthroughs can happen. Five, I just can't say this strongly enough, and I think we're really on a cusp of a new way to move these issues, but I do not know one issue on the global front lines that is now moving <coughs> that is not deploying a multi-stakeholder partnership of some kind. And so uh, they're hard to do. But I will just give you an example. You know, if you work, if you care about, uh, how many of you have any involvement with environmental issues or? Um, so as you know, very big frustration in the climate change talks, right? There's walls all over the place. Well, I personally feel that the announcement by, I think, five of the top retailers of food in the world that they would only source sustainable palm oil. I don't know if you saw that, but Mutar Kent, Paul Pullman of Unilever, Coca-Cola, by 2020. This rocks the world on their axis. And it's a very interesting thing because that actually could be very devastating to people in villages. It requires a public policy component to it. And that table now to go off that action. But, but these multi-stakeholder partnerships require policy people which often don't trust business people and don't speak the same language. And business people who really you know, have not felt respect <coughs> that they would sit down, it's worth their time to really sit down maybe with frontline UN or NGO people. But these collaborations are having a big effect and I will just mention for WFP, I head to a summit that we're running where we brought at the World Economic Forum 140 business leaders from around the world to sit down with heads of state from eight African countries and their finance and ag ministers. And we have over $3.5 billion of commitment across this value chain to end the hunger problem in Africa and help Africa not only feed itself but help feed the world. But these collaborations have you know, so vastly increased the potential for investment um, beyond what aid would get or anything like that. So this is just a sampling of the companies that have come to the table to work with Africa, including the leading African firms, Brazilian firms. And just to say this collaboration has now really gone global. If you see Hillary Clinton with a thousand days when eight foreign ministers came together and declared that they would unite <coughs> to fight the malnutrition of children from conception to two years old. Nick, I don't know how many times you've heard the Secretary of State use the words malnutrition or nutrition. 
very rare, but it's a new era that we're involved in, and the power when you have really hard power people standing behind these issues, they can move. Um, I, I'm very blessed because I started my career in journalism, and in journalism you overcome the fear of appearing stupid. But I, I will just tell you that when you sit around a policy table and you think you're the only one that doesn't know and you don't want to reveal that you don't know, that most people don't know. Okay? I'm just telling you that. Because I have found when I start asking questions, people come up to me all over the place and say, thank God you asked that question. I don't know what they were talking about. Make sure you understand. Don't fake it in life. At the table, get over your embarrassment or go get a mentor or call someone up and say, what does this mean? And make sure you can feel an issue because otherwise you can't leave. It's impossible. <coughs> and so if you stand behind your barrier of fear and asking, why, what, who, where, when, how, uh, it, it, it really, it's, it's a very powerful thing. So I feel like a, a two-year-old question box uh, when I sit at almost any table. It's like, just take me through that again. Take us through that. Um, I was telling Nick when I came to WFP, my first week, uh, my team came and they said, uh, pirates have attacked our ship again. And at that time, WFP was feeding 40% of Somalia. And they've killed our security person and they've taken our food. And I said, well, that's completely unacceptable. The lifeline's cut off to Somalia. This will cause war. It will destabilize the Horn of Africa. This is everyone's concern. I said, it's not acceptable. And I said, so what do we do? And I said, well, we get someone to stop it. And I said, well, who? And I thought, where's Pirate Central? I remember looking at the phone thinking, who do you call? And so, um, in these leadership positions, you have to take it to the next level. And when I asked our team, they said, they said, you know, we can't stop it. I said, why? Why can't we stop it? And I remember getting the Secretary General of NATO and others, and in the end, China ended up helpful, all of Europe has run a convoy, WP ships have never been attacked again. It's one of the most successful multinational collaborations to protect our ships. And that came together, but nobody, 30 ships were attacked before anyone said, well, why? But most importantly, ask why not. And I just want to talk about uh, this for a second. Uh, there's a gentleman named George McGovern, he passed away recently, he ran for president in the 60s, and it was viewed really as almost, even though he had a great military career, the, can the candidate from Woodstock. I mean, he had a dream of a better world, people working together, solving problems. He had a man with a very big heart, and the election didn't go that well for him, but he devoted his Massachusetts life. Massachusetts voted for him. Massachusetts, the only I guess, state. The only state, yes. 49 to 1, yes. he voted for him. Yeah. An amazing man. An amazing yeah. man. And he... Um, he devoted his life to one cause, really, after that, which was making sure every child in school had a cup of food. And so he and I collaborated greatly on this. But when he first sat down with me, I realized no one had ever priced it out. It was like, oh, he's a dreamer. Sweet George McGovern, you know, is fabulous. And so I asked the WP team, price it out. What if WP did it? WP wouldn't do it. But even if, what if an external actor made sure every kid in an LDC, not the countries that could afford it, we use pressure for that, but an LDC who doesn't have food in school had a cup of food, what would it cost? And it was right before the food crisis. And the answer was soup to nuts, the entire cost, um, about one and a half billion dollars. And then the food crisis hit double food prices, so it was about $3.2 billion. And I remember that year, the Christmas bonuses on Wall Street were about, that would have been about 10% of the Christmas bonuses on Wall Street. And I thought, well, is this impossible? Like, why not? 
why not? Can we envision a world where every kid has a cup of food? And when we go to the policy tables, why aren't we talking about this? Why aren't we saying, you know, here's kind of the basic standard, and why aren't we looking at where these pressures are coming and the voices of people around the world demanding just basic dignity and opportunity and saying, why not? Why not? I mean, is it really terrible? And the wonderful thing about food, this cup is from Rwanda, and these kids, it's, this is their greatest possession. I had to assure the kid that I took this from that we were giving him a new cup because it was cracked. His name is Fabia. But if a kid has a cup of food, it changes their life. Girls 12 years old will go out and prostitute themselves just to fill their own cup of food if they don't have that in school. So it's a totally transforming type of thing. So I find very few people ever say, well, why not? Why not? You know, some things are really impossible, but some things really are not that impossible. And I'll just leave you with the last one, <laughs> which always stays with me. You will sit in many, 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 many policy tables in whatever form you're, you end up in life, and you will hear people saying, it's terrible. Everyone's starving there. And yet nothing changes in the dynamic. It is amazing. And if you just look at China, which was WFP's biggest program 20 years ago, and today is a donor to help defeat hunger, anything's possible. China had the biggest famine on record just a generation ago. And now they help feed the world. And so I will say, you know, to you, <coughs> that if we do the same thing over and over again, we're we're going to be in the same place. And it's not just about food. It's about all these issues. So I'll leave us with Einstein. So, <laughs>